Hello, welcome to Money Matters. My name is Malcolm Zeme. The budget is closed. The 2015-2016 financial year budget reading, which is so far unprecedented by size, growing from 18 trillion uh, to 24 trillion shillings in just a year. On view from the top today, we speak to the executive director of CRTD Uganda, Jen Nalunga, on what the budget ought to be. All right, Jens, nice to have you on the show, Money Matters. Um, now, of course, I know you're quite passionate about issues to do with the economy, and uh, recently we saw the IMF giving Uganda a clean bill of health. For starters, what do you make of their conclusion on the state of Uganda's economy, and then the model that is normally used to arrive at these conclusions? Yeah, that, that was really interesting. In a way, in fact, when I saw it, I said, wow, you know, somebody has given us a clean bill of health. That's wonderful. And then I was looking at, you know, the economy itself, you know. And when you look at the trade deficit, it's going up every day because we're exporting raw materials. Uh, when you look at the unemployment rates going up, uh, when you look at industrialization, I don't see any industries to talk about um, when you look at even agricultural production, you know, the standards just recently we had to have a, a self ban, you know. Then I was saying, where is the clean bill coming from? But when you look at the diagnosis, how it, had, it was done, it was the macroeconomic indicators, inflation, GDP, and for me, I think those are not really good indicators of uh, a health of an economy. In your view, what kind of indicators should they be using? Uh, for me, I think the indicators should resonate with what we are as a country, as a people. We are looking at, we are aspiring to, to, to industrialize, to um, export manufactured goods so that we reduce our trade deficit. So, so the indicators should resonate with that. For example, we can talk about looking at manufactured products as a percentage of GDP. So if you, look, you see your manufacturing goods going up, you know you are industrializing, you are producing, you are providing employment, and for me, the, I think these are good indicators instead of you know looking at GDP. Of course, next week we expect the finance minister to read the budget um, for 2015-2016. What are your expectations? Maybe what I should be dreaming, what I should really want to see, other than looking at more investment in key sectors like education and health, because that's investing in people, we need that. I would really like to see more money going to trade and agriculture. Because trade is very critical if we are to trade our way out of poverty. If we can, because trade, the Ministry of Trade combines trade industry, industry is very critical. We need to add value to our products, cooperatives, we need to because the cooperative system was dead, we need to revive it. If we are to produce for the market, cooperatives are a, a must. So, so when you look at all those aspects of that ministry, for me, I think it needs a, more money than the proposed 72, 72 billion shillings. Now, in order, of course, to trade, you must be having what to trade meaning that productivity has to be in the right space. Um, do you think we are doing enough or we've done enough as a country to sort that particular aspect? When you look at our system of agriculture, uh, it's dominated by small-scale farmers. And for me, I think they are doing a great job. We have a program on maize, looking at the maize standards, artists working with the UNBS so that people can be able to produce according to the standards. But it's amazing the way people are producing a lot of maize, a lot. And most of it because of lack of storage facilities, it's rotting out to there, you know. So, so production is there, 
but we need to produce for a specific market. We need to work on the post harvest handling. There are so many issues which needs to be done, but for me I think people are willing and ready to produce. You tell Ugandans, produce Moringa, they will produce it. Aloe vera, they will produce it, you know? So, so we need to put our house in order, and I know people will be able to produce. Now, talking about trading, every time we talk about trading, people think of the EU market and, you know, markets far away. And yet we have a number of markets around us, like the regional markets, I mean, Burundi, Tanzania, and the like. Do you think we've done enough to optimize those opportunities around us as a country? Before you go to other markets, you have the domestic market. Because unless you capture your domestic market, you can't capture any other market. Even import Exactly. You see? Exactly. You know? We are putting on me and you. What we are putting on is all of it from outside. So we need to capture, first of all, our domestic market. And when you capture your domestic market, then you use it as a launching pad to capture other markets. So we need to be able to do that, you know? And we need to be able, when it comes to the regional market, to be able to say what's our competitive and comparative advantage, you know? And then we produce according to the needs of that market, you know? But we are producing because we are an agricultural country. Our agriculture, some people call it agriculture of affection, you know? Your aunt gives you a red bean, you plant it, uh, aunt gives you a, a blue bean, you plant that. So even in one household, you can't produce one, one color of beans, you know. So we need to be able to say what's our market like, what our market needs. Uganda's exposure on a total ban of the country's hot culture exports into the European Union unfortunately seems to be taking shape. New evidence indicates a month-long self-imposed ban by government on 53 official exporters into the 600 million US dollars EU market aimed at quality assurance has come to an end with new incidences of fresh malpractice. This development has put the lead ministries of trade, agriculture and export board and airport security authorities on spot. On the 4th of May, the Ministries of Trade and Agriculture jointly announced a self-imposed ban into the European Union market that sought to enhance quality assurance from the farms all through the packaging to export. Because once that ban is imposed by European Union, it is going to affect the entire economy, it is going to affect our exporters, it's going to affect our farmers. As we talk now, some farmers don't even know where their products are going. Why? Because the exporters don't even want to reveal. And therefore, farmers produce for the sake of producing, and they are not producing for the, that competitive European or even Asian market. But Uganda's own self-imposed ban on the export of horticultural products Partially Chile's the EU market has been violated. What is happening apparently is phytosanitary certificates certificate are still being issued without due inspection of the farms. We can only ask that question to Ministry of Agriculture because we don't know how many people they certified as having passed now the, the we, we have no idea. But the number of interceptions so far in this one month, uh, by last week there were about 12 interceptions from different companies and the number continues to go up. However, the horticultural producers and exporters admit that promoting self-regulation and quality assurance among its members is very difficult. As private sector, we have uh, less mandate and all the tasks is given to the government. So the government acts as a regulator and again as a facilitator. 11th of May, as I've told you, 11 companies were cleared to export. Then 14th, another five companies were cleared to export. From that, they opened the doors that each company that feels they are fit to go back to business, they should apply through the association and then they go for inspection. 
Uganda reaps approximately $600 million or 1.8 trillion shillings in export returns from the European Union market. We still have a section of organic exporters that were, that were exporting some of the uh, crops that are highly affected, like the peppers and, and chilies and, and all the others. But still, because of the strong quality management system, they've been able to, to sort it. Uh, so it, it, it has mainly affected the conventional exporters. According to the Export Promotion Board, this unfortunate development may easily disrupt Uganda's competitiveness on the EU market. We keep uh, waiting on um, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture to give us uh, those companies that have been uh, evaluated and found clean. The challenge is that interceptions uh, have happened even during this period, uh, which is a challenge. and. Uh, all we are avoiding is we don't want to get a ban from the EU. It is on that basis that Uganda now needs a structured and enforceable framework on national value addition if there is to be sustainable impact for the economy. Ultimately, we need to add value to our products. This issue of exporting fresh products to countries and so on does not help. People will tell us, oh, you know, we have, um, we have agreements and this and that, and these countries may not very easily accept processed products. Among others, the four-week self-imposed ban aimed at tracing the production procedures at farms, sorting and packaging, storage and correct coding of products. So when you go out to the shop or supermarket to buy maize flour, do you stop to think about the quality of what you are buying? For instance, white maize flour compared to brown and fortified flour versus non-fortified. When you enter into a shop or a supermarket to buy maize meal, it may no longer be a case of just buying that kilo or two and going home to prepare. You must start looking for value even in the maize meal you buy. You look at uh, maize milling, the higher the refining, because now when we go to buy, people want to buy white flour. White is considered superior. You understand? And that's a higher grade. What makes it white is because Many of the, the, the skin has been removed, the jam has been removed, you're only having that white flour. So it's considered a higher grade, it's sold more expensively, but nutritionally it is less, it has less nutrient. This means you pay higher for less value. So might a lower grade of maize meal cost you less and yet afford you better nutrition value? So normally what we eat, the, the refined component is mainly carbohydrate, low in protein, are low in minerals because the minerals normally go with the husks. But the government has created standards for making sure nutrients are added to foods like maize meal by processors and packers. We have added standards to what we call fortification of the food, that is to add nutrients to food, knowing that the natural maize may not be having quite enough because of the limitations of the soil and, and so on. And of course the milling process also, they remove some bran and so on. And, and then we know that generally the population does not have enough nutrients because of the challenges of nutrition generally. So we now have standards to add nutrients into that into that and when we're talking about nutrients we are talking about adding vitamin for example vitamin a vitamin b1 b2 b b6 b12 and then we're talking about adding uh, uh, micronutrients uh, adding other other mineral sources like iron and, and zinc there are regulations on packaging and this is where you the consumer should look at what you are buying and the packing material should be clean and should be of uh, good quality that is able to protect the food uh, then it is packed and sealed in there and then that package naturally should be printed already with labels to inform the consumer when this was packed. The UNBS is having a food fortification mark. It's F, capital F, encircled with something. So any product which is fortified, be it oil, be it flour, it has that food fortification mark. When you see F, you know it is fortified. But our challenge is that uh, people, consumers, do not look at uh, food labeling. They, many of us, many of our local persons, not only local persons, even the elite. 
If you want nutritious maize meal, grade 2 flour has some nutrients. Grade 1 that is fortified will have what you need, but only large millers produce this. Like many industries, leather has its own challenges. Yet there are those Ugandans that have dared to add value to this product as opposed to exporting grow hides as is widely done. In this week's Your Money segment, what does it take to get involved in the leather industry? We speak to a player in this business. With five major tanning industries and only one ginger-based leather industry processing hides and skins up to the finished product stage, this state of affairs takes the cost price a notch high. You find the leather here costs like two dollars, which is which is expensive here. You are now if you are buying a one square one square foot of like two dollars, you find now it's like six thousand square foot to make. And the payer can take like three square feet. So you find you find how here leather it becomes too expensive. Even some like now when you are making a shoe, you need some other materials like soles, like insoles, like so many like shanks. Also key to note is the tax on raw materials. Now when you are buying a so they see, they see it as a finished product. Well, here we call now uh, when we are using it, we buy it as a raw material. But when they are taxing it, they tax the, the uh, sole like a finished product, which is uh, I see it really. We need just, we need to uh, some adjustment there. How then does one make money in this kind of business environment? You have to calculate to get to add there some little bit of profit. That's that's why maybe leather sector. Here in Uganda is still not growing so fast because of the materials to be high. So maybe we need the intervention of maybe government to come in. And uh, we have so many tunnels because here we have one tunnel and maybe somehow they don't have a competitor. That's why I think leather is, uh, is somehow expensive. Also key to note is the price of leather on the local market. The price of the leather, now a square foot of this leather in Uganda shillings can cost like 8,000 to 10,000. It depends which country is coming from. Again, this one is patent leather but printed one. Yeah, it's, it has the same price, like, like 10,000 a square foot. This one is blue leather, as you see. The same, we, normally we use this one on bags. And ladies' shoes, this one. Yeah. And the, uh, the price, it's around like 8,000 Uganda shillings. One must also acquire machinery for processing and bear in mind the cost of power. Like sewing machines, scoring machines, uh, clicking, clicking machine, uh, and, other, and other many uh, machines that we use. They are somehow expensive to buy them, even to maintain them. Uh, they consume power, and power is expensive. Here is yet another entrepreneur telling us about the ups and downs of business and how staying afloat is possible. Isaac Serwanga Luanga pursued a degree in education with a clear intention of becoming a teacher. However, on trying his hand out in the profession, he realized that this may not actually be the path for him. When I reached the school, Actually, I think I was just over ambitious. I realized I was not really getting to where I wanted to do to do to get. So I hit the streets. Uh, first, I was in uh, I was I was I was on Loom Street. I started a small shop selling DVDs and uh, fridges, you know. And of course, while I was there, I realized that there was a problem between uh, us. And, and the Indian community, we were saying the same things and they were saying theirs cheaply and we, I, we, I couldn't really make ends meet. From Luwum Street he went on to set up a car garage which is still in existence today and is one of his side businesses. But his light bulb moment came when he discovered the existing gap in the market when it comes to children's transportation. You cannot believe it but Kampala has 
over a million kids that go to school using public means. And that is a very big number. Actually, right now, even if 20 people start this business today, they will, have, they will all have clients because they are there. With not so much initial capital, the kids shuttle business was off to a rocky beginning. I didn't have money. Uh, I, I, I asked a friend of mine to give me a loan of six million and I also sold my land and I got another six. I bought a very old van of around, around 11 or 12 so million. Uh, but it, it was also challenging because <clears throat> At that time, I had kids that were living all over the place. Some are in Chireka, others are in Entebbe. So the fuel crossing town and the traffic jam, it was all a maze. However, through perseverance, he grew his clientele and he brought on board schools like Kaboja, Aga Khan and Green Hill until he decided that this did not make too much business sense. Go to Aga Khan, go to Golden Bell Junior, go to Golden Bell Kindergarten, go to... I go, I used to run around. But then I realized that actually you don't make the money there, you actually spend it all. And then I zeroed it down. First I realized that I need to work on only one village. But because his business of dealing with children is an extremely sensitive one, the greatest challenge for Seranga comes when it comes to hiring the right personnel. I have to be frank with you, the people that we use are semi-illiterate. Because we don't have that much money to pay the people that really sit in these vans. So, the people that we pick, sometimes they also have so many problems, so many uh, challenges in life. But those are the guys that can take sometimes the money that we have. So we sometimes try to talk to them, try to make them realize that they are actually transporting somebody's gold. So for anyone interested in going into the business of transporting children, Seranga has solid advice for you to successfully tap into the vast market. If you want to start a shuttle company, you go to a school, tell them that, look here guys, I have a shuttle company and I want to transport your kids. Whether you have it or not. Whether you have it or not. When they give you these kids, you will hire a van. You can do, start this business without money. Because our business, we are paid up front. So you use that same money to pay off the van, to pay off fuel, and you keep the balance into your pocket. Isaac Seronga gave up his dream of becoming a teacher and ventured into the world of business, albeit one that still involves children, and he says that this is a decision he does not regret and one that he remains passionate about. Now is the time for us to have a look at the equity market with the losers and gainers of the day. That's it this week on Money Matters. My name is Malcolm Sime. Please do get back to us. Send us a text on 6565. You could also look for NTV Money Matters on Facebook and leave your comments and views about the program. <music>